Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are speaking with Emiliana Vegas, author of the new book, Let's Change the World, How to Work Within International Development Organizations to Make a Difference. Emiliana Vegas has been highly recognized for her career working to inform education policy in the so-called Global South. She has been a leading economist at the World Bank, Division Chief of Education at the Inter-American Development Bank, and co-director of the Center for Universal Education at the Brookings Institution. She is currently a professor of practice at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Emiliana Vegas, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you for having me, David. Thank you for coming on and for writing the book. Uh, the book, I think, is a fantastic guide to how to obtain and advance a career in international development organizations. But I want to start with what may be a really stupid question. Uh, do international development organizations help the world? Because I think a lot of people see the recent UN climate conference as not just a massive failure, but predictably and intentionally so. And they see so-called aid to Gaza as a sick pretense. And they believe global financial organizations in debt and exploit the world. And that government agencies like USAID are less interested in philanthropy and a little more in empire. So can you talk about the good that international development organizations do? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I feel that international development organizations, like any organization, um, does what most of the people in it end up wanting to do. So one of the things I discovered in my career um, in global funding institutions and then in think tanks and now in academia that work in international development is that there's resources and there's access to decision making and that in the end, how you help decision makers make better decisions, how you support, you know, situations in crisis is a lot about the workers and the staff in these organizations and what are their motives and what are their um, skills and, and, and dispositions. And I found that one of the reasons I wrote the book is to encourage people who have the right motives and who want to make a difference in the world to join these institutions and make a difference because they do allow you to do that. Um, so, but they don't always do it for sure. And so I, I talk a little bit in the book about, um, you know, people who are pursuing their own agendas and not those of the people who need them, you know, who need the, the, the support of international development organizations. Um, and a lot of them, of course, I ran into um, at the same time, if you have the desire to affect, let's say, improve education or health or climate um, in uh, the developing world and the low and mi middle income countries that need help and need resources and need capacity, these are great platforms to, to do that. You write in the book about education work in, in Uruguay and in Chile and in Panama. Can you talk a little bit about what you're most proud of having done? Well, I had a long career and I'm proud of, I, I guess, a lot of different ways in which I made a difference. I think um, those particular cases were cases where I was um, fairly junior in my career, to be honest, and given a lot of responsibility um for projects that uh, were quite ambitious so the one in chile the government um had requested world bank assistance to help them reform the um institutions at the central level of the national level that assure quality in education so they had a ministry of education and then they had municipal governments running public schools but they had a lot of evidence from years of student assessment um showing that uh, students who attended private subsidized schools, so voucher schools, uh, were outperforming students who attended public schools, even though both received about the same amount of funding. And that a lot of it had to do with uh, sorting across schools by students, by socioeconomic background of the family. So families were choosing schools that had peers that were at least at their same you know, socioeconomic 
income level. Um, they didn't want their children to go to, you know, with more, with poorer kids. Um, and so that created this sort of screen segregation um, and a lot of inequality in outcomes that was less due to what the schools were doing and more due to what, you know, where students ended up. Um, and so the uh, government asked World Bank, you know, what do other countries like ours that has a nationwide school choice program and that funds public schools and private schools, um, how, how can they assure quality and equity in the system? And so I was, um, I, I basically led this work and I was, one of the things I'm proud of is that I w did not have the skills, to be honest. I realized quickly enough, I'm not a comparative education specialist or I wasn't at the time, I was an economist um, of education. And we economists tend to think of problems at the margins. So how do we improve a little bit given a system? And this was more like, how do you restructure the system to begin with? And so, um, I reached out to my advisor, my former advisor at Harvard. I, I went to Harvard as well as a student and he um, connected me to some, or, or mentioned that I should reach out to some people, including the former head of the delivery unit for prime minister, Tony Blair in England, in the UK, I should say. And, um, and Michael Barber, Sir Michael Barber was so generous with his time and excited to come help. And I, I think he took my call because I was at the World Bank. I was not a known quantity at all. Um, so that to me is an example of one, the access that it gives you to expertise. And then if you care, like I did, to bring the best knowledge to inform the Chileans who were wanting to do the best they could given their challenges, um, then you can really figure it out. And I'm proud because after many months, about a year in which I ended up going to Chile about every month to make consultations, to, you know, refine the recommendations that we were, you know, initially thinking about, um, get more data, et cetera. The uh, president uh, presented a, a law proposal to parliament that was approved. And today, and, and this was in actually 2008, but that law, um, you know, many years later has now, you know, has installed two new agencies at the central level that basically took from the ministry some functions and also added some that the ministry wasn't carrying out, um, including, you know, trying to learn about how schools themselves use public funding, you know, what's the inside of what economists call the education production function, you know, so how, what are the inputs that they're using to produce outcomes and that way provide better information. Um, to schools. And so, you know, Chile is not where it wants to be in terms of learning and in terms of learning gaps, but it certainly has made a lot of progress um, for the better, especially in terms of reducing learning gaps. It, has that progress lasted through the various presidents and governments in, in, in Chile? You're sort of subject to what governments are willing to do, right? Yes, but what's interesting about how policy making it happens in Chile is that um, parliament has to approve any major reforms and it and, and they have to do so by a super majority. So it's very hard in Chile to have one party sort of get what they want through parliament without some agreement and some compromise and some negotiation with the other party. And so when they do um, approve a law, um, they tend to Implement it, even though, you know, some of the things we've seen is that, you know, if, if one party wasn't so in favor in the first place and they compromised and they got somewhere in between, they might cause some delays in implementation, <laughs> um, but it still happens. It's just, you know, with a little bit less speed. Yeah, I, it, it was also interesting when you were in Chile and you met with the labor union folks and they said the World Bank has been here for so many years and this is the first time anyone has asked to speak with the teachers union. Um, and, in, and in Uruguay, you investigated how the classes were taught in the schools and it seemed nobody had been doing that before. So, uh, I mean, are these examples of how the work varies? Uh, Doing it. You know, one of the reasons I tell that story is um, because when I was uh, fairly early in my career, the World Bank had uh, inst instituted a, a policy internally 
that and and funded basically um the idea that we would learn from each other's work in different parts of the world and so i was working in chile with a more senior person and another senior person who was working in central america came along on our mission just to learn how things worked and our counterpart so the government official from the chilean side who worked with us asked this colleague from central america you know how does the world bank work in central america and his answer struck me. And, and basically he said, you know, here in Chile, the World Bank is Juan Prada. Juan Prada was my mentor and the person running the World Bank's um, operations in Chile when I started. And he said, in Central America, it's me. And basically it's very person dependent. And I thought there was something fundamentally wrong with that approach because I felt like for an organization that has around 10,000 employees, um, you know, more than half of whom are all over the world. How can it not have some better standardization? We don't want like standards that are too inflexible, but at least some, you know, standards that we expect of every representative to do in, um, in every sector. And so later in my career, I went to the global practice of the World Bank and I actually worked on some basic standards so that whoever you were in working in the education sector, you know, you would be able to have some basic information about your country and how they compared with countries that had really strong education outcomes so that you could start a conversation around, you know, are your school finance policies, um, you know, going to get you where you want to be and how do they compare to those of countries that have much better outcomes. Um, and that project still exist. It's called Systems Approach for Better Education Results. And a lot of what I learned in that first project in Chile is what I applied, the sort of comparative analysis of education policies. Um, yeah. But also with this idea that, you know, when you study a PhD in the US and probably everywhere, um, you focus a lot, you, you get deep, deep, deep in one area, usually your dissertation topic. For me, that was teacher policies in Latin America. And when you work in these organizations, you no matter who you are and how experienced you are, it's, it's very hard to know about everything. And sometimes countries don't need you to advise them on teacher policies or don't want to borrow for, you know, teacher reforms. They need early childhood or they need technical vocational training. And so this work in Sever was really trying to give some basic evidence and information to people in the front lines like I used to be to have some, you know, starting points. Um, and then they could do more investigation if they wanted to, but they at least would have some basic knowledge of where their country was vis-a-vis -vis where they should be, let's say. We are speaking with Emiliana Vegas and the book is called Let's Change the World, How to Work Within International Development Organizations to Make a Difference. Um, turning maybe more to what the book is really about, um, what should somebody do who wants to get involved in this sort of work? Um, and where should they go to work where they can do the most good at it? So I tell, you know, I train a lot of uh, masters and, and PhD students here at Harvard who want to have careers in international development and in global education. And um, I tell them, you know, there are basically three really fundamental skills that um, will help you get in and, and thrive. The first one is um, deep analytical skills. So being able to review evidence, to analyze data um, and make sense of it and apply it to solve problems that are complex, you know, improving education in very marginal, marginalized settings is not an easy task. And there's lots of barriers to that. And so you need to see it from a um, multi-sectoral perspective. You need to have actual data to see what's the, the you know, what are the, the nuances of the problem in that particular context. And you need to also understand how have, what, what does the evidence say about what works to address those challenges? And so that's one big bucket of skills that I call analytical skills that, those you generally develop in college and graduate schools. Um, the second one is what we call strong communication skills, both orally and in writing. So no matter how brilliant you are and how analytical you are and how great you are at uh, analyzing problems and, and providing recommendations, if you can't communicate them in a way that 
a, you know, a person who's not as technical as you can understand, um, you're not going to be successful. And so I tell, I work a lot with my students on, you know, how do you write a compelling memo to a decision maker that has the evidence, but doesn't use jargon, for example, because our decision makers might not be economists, are not likely to be super specialized. They're more likely to be general politicians. Um, but we want to persuade them and they care too, and in general, hopefully. <laughs> um, and so you want to give them arguments in favor and with evidence in a way that they can consume. And then the third big uh, bucket I call is like collaboration skills, being able to work across differences. Um, in these institutions, you have people from all over the world, from multiple religions, ethnicities, race, who speak different languages and come from different cultural backgrounds. So the more you can... Um, you know, recognize that we all are fundamentally human beings and work across differences, um, you're going to be more successful because most of the work is in teams. It's very rare that you do something by yourself in an international development organization. Um, so those would be three. And then there, of course, you know, if you speak multiple languages, it will help you. But that's not even a, a deal breaker because they, these institutions tend to invest in language training for their staffs. Um, so... Um, <laughs> so where do you get all those skills? <laughs> well, certainly at Harvard. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> I try. Um, but, you know, there's many, I've hired people from many great uh, universities across the world. I've hired people who bring those skills um, from a master's program and others who have a PhD. I, I do say in the book that for many of these institutions, because um, staff positions, particularly for uh, young early career professionals, are very limited, um, they're super competitive. Um, you know, you can you're competing with people from all over the world who are going to you know who may not let's say be from America but have gone to really good schools in America. You're competing from with Europeans and those who are not Europeans have been, but have gone to some of the best universities in Europe, and so. Um, having a graduate school ends up being almost a requirement. Um, there are some programs for college graduates that are short term in nature that give you kind of like an opportunity to get your feet wet, do some research assistant roles, maybe some policy analyst roles and figure out if that's the, you know, the path you want to take. But then usually they kind of encourage you to go out and get another, another degree before you come back. I, I was interested in some of your tips in the book. Uh, you have to be careful which jobs you take and you don't maybe want to work for the branch of an organization that critiques the other branches because it won't advance your future career. <laughs> that was very interesting. Yes, I, yeah, I say the story because I, so most of the large organ inter international organizations have an uh, sort of a, an internal, but at the same time, not part of the general bureaucracy reporting directly to the governing board, uh, independent evaluation agency. And a lot of um, people who started the careers with me or shortly after me, um, and couldn't land a job in the regular part, but knew a lot about evaluation would go to that section. And I, I, I do say in a sort of off the cuff kind of insider's view way, because it's, it's still a very legitimate, very valued um, job, but I think people don't like to be criticized. And so in the end, you know, when many of these younger people start their careers in those agencies and then want to make a switch to the larger part of the World Bank or Inter-American Development Bank and work in, in that sector, they've kind of burnt some bridges along the way. Yeah, so you got to be careful. Um, I, I, I really want to ask about Venezuela. You were born in Venezuela and like dozens of other countries, uh, the United States government puts sanctions on that country. How do, inter -develop how do international development organizations actually work to help a country as opposed to work to change the government of a country when a nation like the United States government has has the latter goal in mind? I mean, there's a reason why the United States has, you know, imposed sanctions in Venezuela. Um, it has to do um, with a combination of 
a democratic country turning, you know, dictatorial, and we've we just had elections in um, a few months ago, and it was um, very hard for the opposition to even have a candidate, and um, and the election was not a level playing field by any stretch of the imagination. But our opposition leaders organized um, something that really was quite remarkable. They organized to have an external internet server and immediate processing of all the votes with photos of the actual tallies and the data recorded. And so for the first time after many fraudulent elections, it's unquestionable that the regime lost and they're not willing to give up power. And instead, they're um, becoming even more uh, violent. They have put children in jail. They have put everybody associated with the opposition that they can find in jail. There's reports of torture. There's deaths that had happened. So it's extremely dire. And they've ruined the economy. Venezuela, when I grew up in the 70s and 80s, was um, the most stable democracy in the region, the oldest democracy in the region, and also one of the most uh, gr fastest growing economies due to um, you know the luck that we have oil, large one of the largest reserves of oil in the world, but we also had a very professionalized oil industry. It was state owned, but it partnered with foreign company, but the country had invested a lot in training um, young people and leaders to run the oil industry and to work in it, engineers, economists, et cetera. And so, one of the first things Hugo Chavez came, did when he was um, president uh, in his first few years was um, fire many of these people who had protested that he was um, appointing political loyalists instead of technical people to run the oil industry. And that was in the 90s. And today we have um, a fraction, a very small fraction of the revenues from oil. We have huge poverty rates. Now uh, the Venezuelan per capita GDP or the income per capita is at the level of Hades, which is the poorest nation historically in the region. We have no security, no safety. And so, you know, in these cases, I, I believe that a, a democratic government who has resources has the responsibility. I mean, it's not just the U.S. who have sanctioned Venezuela, the European Union. Most Democrat Western democracies have done that. Most Western democracies have also recognized that um, we have a new president that's been elected by the people who is right now in exile. And we have an opposition leader who's in hiding because the government is threatening them with their lives. Um, so how can international development organizations help in these circumstances? Some international development organizations are have as their primary mission to to serve humanitarian causes, so to help um, fight oppression and help provide, for example, nutrition and health services in the most um, difficult conditions. And those some of those are still operating in Venezuela, um, but they they're also experiencing a lot of you know problems if they're seen as you know, pro-democratic, which many of them are, right? They want freedoms as well. Um, so they have to do it very carefully. Institutions like the World Bank, like the Inter-American Development Bank, they have a harder time because a lot of them, um, so the main way in which the big global funders work is through government. They work with ministries of finance to provide financial resources and then through that, some technical assistance. Um, so those operations are almost all frozen. Um, and also, to be honest, I mean, I was at the Inter-American Development Bank as Division Chief of Education when the U.S. under the Trump administration recognized um, as president of Venezuela, uh, Juan Guaido, who had been the president of the Congress, and there had been another fraudulent election. And by our constitution, if if there hasn't been a clean election, then the president of Congress has to has the power of presidency. And so there was a big effort of the opposition at that time to be recognized internationally in many countries, including the US recognized, and, and the IDB was one of the few multilateral organizations that recognized this other government. 
And um, we were all working endless hours to develop programs and plans so that when they were able to have a peaceful transition and get into government, they would have resources to um, to improve schools, you know, improve the financial system, the oil industry, et cetera. And that never happened because this regime became more and more entrenched and used more of its own um, army and, and military to oppress people. Well, these these elections are always very much disputed, and it's very hard for me to judge from here. But it always seems that cutting off all these funds and sanctioning a country while justifying it by blaming the country for being economically poor uh, is a little bit of a vicious cycle and a contradiction, right? I mean, to, it's it, certainly a, also a contradiction in the sense that, for example, two days ago, there was a massive um, fire in one of the main um, gas producing power plants in Venezuela that powers all the electricity, electric grid of 80% of the country. And because of the sanctions, the regime can say, oh, it's the U.S. and our enemies that have done this and not take you know, responsibility for the fact that it's years of lack of maintenance and lack of investment that may have caused this rather than like an invasion of the U.S. or intervention of their enemies. <laughs> so well, it's a have... vicious cycle. <laughs> how, how can I judge knowing nothing about it, but sanctioning and cutting off all of the funds to a country cannot help them succeed economically. It can only hurt them. Um, we, yeah. we, we, we've got just one minute left. Maybe I can ask one more crazy question. Um, as, a, as a peace activist who knows there are peace organizations, anti-war organizations across Latin America that have no money whatsoever, why why do big international organizations, because everybody says they're for peace, why do they, why is that never a cause that's funded? I, I mean, I'm, I'm all in favor of education. I'm in favor of ending poverty. I'm in favor of all the good causes. But look at Ukraine. We may, we may all die for lack of supporting peace. Why is that? Why is, why does nobody ever fund that? That's a, I mean, I honestly am not a specialist on peace like you are. So um, I I'm think, funding the way, it. <laughs> well, but, but uh, let, let me try and say something. I think there are global institutions whose primary mandate is to um, focus on peace and sort of, um, I call them conveners, but really setting shared agendas across different governments. The United Nations is the, you know, the place that or the most funded of them. Um, and within the UN, I think because they have a governing structure that's so complicated and in some ways crazy because the body that is supposed to, you know, sanction countries that are uh, violating peace agreements, et cetera, the countries that have been elected into that body include Russia and include other aggressors. So it's it's kind of crazy, like how our democracies work sometimes in a crazy ways within countries. It's the same way in international development organizations. Um, in in Venezuela, for example, you know one of the ways in which you guarantee peace, right, is to to have representation, to have democratic processes, right? Because that allows people's voice to be heard. And um, and in, in my own country, there's been international observing organizations of many elections, the Carter Center from Atlanta, the OAS, the Organization of American States. And, you know, they're funded by clearly someone and they have a mandate and they carry out those functions. Um, but it's insufficient to get people to do the right thing, right? The Carter Center came out with a very strong report um, documenting that the opposition leader won in Venezuela by at least 80% of the votes, that there were many people, including people like me who reside outside Venezuela, who in the past could vote, who were not allowed to vote in our own elections. You know, And so in spite of all the things against, um, you know, there, there was uh, 
you know, sufficient evidence that the government that that Maduro had lost the election, and 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 a high call for them to you know manage a, a peaceful transition of power, which they have not um, began accepting or initiated, and um, and it's unlikely to happen if at all. Um, so. You know, I think your, your your hands, you can only do so much, I, I I think, as international. I mean, we've learned this the hard way in Venezuela, to be honest, because there were times when um, we were hoping for a sort of U.S. invasion, take out these bad people, help us have peace. Um, and now we recognize nobody's going to come in and save us. We have to organize ourselves as a community. We can highlight and, and ask for support, but in the end, it's us who have to um persuade not just um people to vote but people to stay and hold leaders accountable and people to do the right thing i mean we know in our country that the military is divided the top of the military is supporting their regime and they've been benefiting financially tremendously from that alliance but the rest of the military are equally poor, suffering all the same malaises of lack of health services, education services, lack of affordable food. And, and so yeah. when will it turn? It's it's a matter of time. I'm hopeful that it will turn. I think we have for the first time a, a super um, united opposition, which we didn't have in the past. So, you know, I... I like I said, I'm not naive about international development organizations and stating that they can solve all the world's problems. I do think that they provide a venue for people who want to make a difference to do it. And I wish more people would join with those objectives and those skill sets, because then it would be a different world. Then I think we would have more, more impact. I would like to ask a million more questions, but we are way over time. We've been speaking with Emiliana Vegas and the book is called Let's Change the World, How to Work Within International Development Organizations to Make a Difference. Emiliana, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you, David, for having me. It's been a pleasure. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.